This is the Shadow Chronicles podcast. We are here to take a deep dive into the inner work, generational trauma and your shadows. Having those hard conversations so you don't have to. You know, all of that shit that just does not get spoken about. In the third drawer down, in the dark, hidden away. My name is Scott and I'm a shadow integration specialist. I am here to help guide you on your journey to unfuck yourself by integrating your shadows, healing the generational trauma so you can vibrate with confidence and just fucking love your life. And my name is Todd, who's an integrative health coach. I help people own more of who they are, change their lives on many different levels to become who they really are. Find your compass and follow it, to say it simply. And welcome back. Thank you for welcoming me. Because <laughs> it's obviously all about me. That's right. Mm. You know. Not, not, not listeners or guests at all. No, 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 mm. no. All about you. Anyway. Hey, guys. <laughs> So, following on from our last episode, mm-hmm. we're going to be talking a little bit more about perception filters today. Mm-hmm. What are they? Where they come from? How they affect all the things? Mm-hmm. We get to talk about reticular activation systems today. Cool. And Todd's throwing out fancy words again. I thought I'd get it out of the way early. Yeah. Which essentially means is how we, you know, distort, filter and store information. And colour it and prioritise it and program it. Yep, that'll do. Because that's a good word. Mm. So, do you want to give the lowdown of what perception filters are? Yes. Because <laughs> I just don't like, your turn, under the bus. Yeah, no, you that's go. fair enough. Okay. Sorry, the, the answer was always yes. It was just like, how am I going to frame this so that I can say yes with confidence but still not say it with confidence <laughs> anyway? Mm. Uh, perception filters in the shorter version of it are the way in which we filter the information and I, I guess from a certain point of view attach meaning to the things that happen within and around us that isn't just a neutral, objective thing that happened, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So in, a, in a, a nice visual for all the neurospicy people out there, basically it is how two people can go through the same event and have completely different responses to it. Interpretations, attached meanings, mm-hmm. positive or negative associated, all of the above. Yep. Mm. And those... Filters are coloured by, uh, might be easier to make a list of what they aren't <laughs> coloured by. Yep. Uh, sleep, emotional state, mm-hmm. hormonal regulation, fatigue, neuro spiciness, <laughs> um, or at least the momentary neuro spiciness of emotional, physical, oh well, like how well fed you are changes how you perceive things. Yeah. You know the old like don't go shopping when you're hungry? Yeah, don't do that. That, that That's a filter. Yeah. It's like because if you have the hunger filter on and you go shopping, are they going to be the decisions that are going to make your shopping trip uh, very valuable? Yeah, and Todd's laughing because I've managed to tangle myself in cords again. I, I didn't know it was that hard. You know, no, no, <laughs> not that doing, not doing that to you today. That would be me filtering my perception of you currently, which ah. is uh, unnecessary. <laughs> right. Mm. Mm. So I guess it goes along the same lines as like you know the hunger thing that you were saying. You know, when you when you're hungry, like now count me off. This is wrong because I, you know, recalling it off the top of my head. Um, when you're hungry, you hate everyone. When you're tired, you. Th- Everyone, think you everyone hates, hates you. you. Yep. Um, and what was the third one? I don't know if there was a third one. Okay, there was something else in there along yeah. that saying. Um, when you need food, you hate everyone because your blood sugar dumps. Yeah. When you're tired, tired, you think everyone hates you because you... You're in survival mode. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, your brain goes into that flight and fight state, so yeah. it's looking to survive. Yeah. And especially if that's the meaning that you've attached to Mm. that feeling state previously and this is what i guess we're really talking about it's like perception filters like Mm. well when i'm tired 
maybe you're a little bit more sensitive to the comments that would otherwise be fairly neutral or at least well-intentioned yeah. that become kind of douchey <laughs> in your head yeah. that you then interpret as everyone hurts me. Yeah, well, I was a little bit sensitive. I know, I can be a lot sensitive when I'm tired. But that's the point. Yeah. So how much of that acts as a filter by mm. which the world happens around you, let alone your interpretation of it? Yeah. Like how often do we twist our perception of ourselves in that space? So, so like that analogy of like, you know, you think everyone hates you. It's like when you're sleep deprived, you're in that lower functionality. Mm. So everything seems like a threat. Yeah. Regardless of whether it is or not. Mm. And then you employ a whole bunch of coping mechanisms in response to that, which let's be honest, for most people, just kind of deepens the hole that they've just dug for themselves. How much caffeine have you had today? And, and that's that's the other side of it. So in a purely like physiological sort of sense, mm. if you're sleep deprived, part of your survival mechanisms will interpret that as a lack of energy. Yeah. So you go looking for cheap, nasty energy, which is why you don't go shopping when you're hungry or tired because you'll make poorer decisions about the quality of food you're about to buy. If you're tired and hungry, that's usually when people go looking for sugar and caffeine. Yeah. Weirdly, that has a knock-on effect that does not help no. that headspace. Right. So that's the short version. Yeah, definitely. And I get like, as I, like, and as I mentioned beforehand, it was just like how two people can go through the same thing and have completely different interpretations of that. It's, I guess, the same as what people would, I guess, like associate to what something that was really traumatizing or something that, you know, and then the other person can look at that and go, Time. yeah, like, what the fuck are you talking about? That but was nothing. So it would have been a couple of episodes ago. I was talking about, like, I, I work with a lot of veterans. Yeah. And there's a certain amount of PTSD snobbery. Snobbery? Snobbery. Because, yeah, okay. Because... Pff, what have you got PTSD from? You, know, you can go to war and have to shoot someone or get shot in uh, turn. You, you see yeah, what I mean? So I've copped like, that myself personally. But what it never really takes into account is because that's that person's perceptions of the things that are worthy of having PTSD from. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping you can hear the derision in my voice and no one's out there going, I'm tired and hungry and Todd's saying some shit that <laughs> I'm, I'm interpreting. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's a pretty all-encompassing subject that yeah. is super objective and super subjective at the same time. Yeah, depending on who's you, like, who you're talking to, what's going on, upbringings, all of those sort of things. And I know like your, like your perception filters, for example, when you're very young and go through a very traumatic event – you know, your filters will automatically delete and distort that information in order to survive. You know what's Because wild? the brain can't cope with that. Memories just do that anyway. Yeah. Regardless of the trauma or the severity or the insignificance of it. Yeah. I, would, I did a um, – I've been diving into neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. which has been super fun. And, like, I think we spoke about on the last episode about neuropriming. Neuropriming? Neuropriming. Or neural pruning. Both. Good. Um, and I was, I, was like, I hope we talked about both. Um, and I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, I remember this now. And it was really interesting because it was obviously another way of, you know, essentially um, how to, you know, train your brain, really. Um, but it was in a way where I, I'm like, I've learned this information before. I'm just hearing it differently now, mm. which has been super cool. Um, but I really learned because I knew, you know, memories delete themselves automatically and all of that sort of stuff. But a really interesting thing was and how people c have trouble recalling memory and how people also, you know, when they recall a memory, that changes, you know, every time they recall it is because one memory is actually, if it is stored um, into the, the unconscious, it's stored in like 15 different places. Like they break, the memory breaks up and gets stored in all different parts of the brain. 
Um, because all those different parts of the brain regulate different things. All all for different things, like, you know, emotional stuff there and then, like, physical stuff there and then, you know, something else back there. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's fascinating. It's why, like, you you hear stories about core memory. It's like suddenly a smell triggers this. Yeah. So that's why that stuff's relevant because if a a key component of a traumatic memory, for example, is the smell of gunfire yeah around you sort of thing and you hear this sound like a, i don't know a helicopter or something like that and this is like with more of your like war veterans and this sort of mm. stuff it's that sound or that smell or that sensation that creates a deep enough neural groove that's the correct word well done yep <laughs> i was making that up no that, that's it it's okay. literally called a neural groove yeah so to make the ability to connect all of those disparate parts of that memory up mm. like that. Yeah. And that's the point. And depending on the quality or kind of – or <laughs> the meaning attached to that memory is yeah. almost the problem. So if it is a trauma-based thing, yeah, the ease by which you can bring that shit back, back. up for you, yeah, that's almost the problem. Yeah. Like if there was a bit more – distance to it like the, if it was a bit harder to just bring up yeah casually yeah it probably wouldn't be the same brutality yep that'll do yeah and so are you meaning like you know how easily it's brought up so as you mean by that filter per se and that neuro groove of you know smelling the gunpowder and hearing the helicopter or whatever it happens to be you know which recalls that whole memory but then to, you know, because what I find with a lot of people that I work for, when they're in that, like, as you, like at that trigger space, because mm. that's essentially what it is, it's a trigger, um, they can recall it straight away. But then to talk about it, that it, there's, they, 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 because I speak proper English, they struggle to recall it. I think it's an interaction of the subconscious and the conscious the mind. mind. Yeah. So the conscious mind oh, was it doesn't want to remember that shit. Yeah, and then you it's subcon- painful and awkward. Yeah, because the subconscious has got that, um, you know, neuro groove or that pathway or that, and that, it's that filter. Such potent, yeah, powerful part of your well brain, your mind, your well, consciousness. You know, well, like you know, as we know, everything gets stored in the nervous system as well. Um, and if the nervous system has been trained, you know, which is how you create a neuro groove, is you train it. Mm. Um, if that's been trained that you hear a helicopter and and then you smell gunpowder, even if there's no gunpowder around, even if it's there's just that initial step, that initial step, that's going to trigger the the core in your nervous system to go fuck. We're in danger. Yeah, get out. And you have that endocrinal hormonal flood, yeah. the norepinephrine mm. and all this sort of stuff that just elevates and heightens the adrenaline. Yeah. That whether it started or perpetuates or heightens that emotional yep. fight or flighty response. Yeah. It's just yeah, it's it's a slippery slope to put it mildly. Yeah. So essentially what that means is you've then filtered that's your perception filter for that thing. Mm. And until you change that perception filter, that is always going to be the thing that sets off mm-hmm. that thing. Because because it's it's nervous system consciousness subconscious all of the above it's being mm. determined as important yeah it's a big deal mm. and consequently you have that heightened response because it's inverted commas a big deal yeah um, if you go looking for red flags you're gonna fucking you'll fuck. find red flags yeah if she goes looking through your phone even if there's nothing to find she'll find something. Yeah. At that you know what I mean. Yeah. It's like it's that it becomes effectively a self fulfilling prophecy at the same time. Mm. It's like whatever you're looking at you know what? Maybe we don't want to go into that particular content <laughs> just now because that's another episode that I'm about to steal the thunder of. Yeah. But that's a confirmation bias conversation too. Yeah. That's one of the ways in which we apply perception filters to normalise 
how we perceive the world. Yeah. Which sounds like a, like a circular conversation. Kind of is though, isn't and it? And it absolutely is. Yeah. It's like how, we talked – well, I hope I brought it up before. This squishy bit between your ears. Yeah. Not your nose. <laughs> <laughs> Because I've had some people say, what the fuck's the nose going to do it? <laughs> Your brain is built to keep you safe and right. Yep. And the thing about the perception filters is that those act on wanting to make you right mm. and feel safe with that interpretation. As we've discussed several times so far, mm. safe doesn't mean good. Safe no. means normal. Yeah. And like the, the the helicopter that triggers the war memories and all this sort of stuff, mm. it's, it, it's normal. Yeah. So it's normal to have this spike of adrenaline that puts you straight into fight or flight. Yeah. That you consciously do not want. Yeah. But this is what you got. Mm. Yeah. And like I was, I was talking about core memories a little while ago. Yeah. Just like that's the way we form those memories. It's just this such a profound level of emotion mm-hmm. and other stimulating factors that go into that well, sight, smell, all, sensation. All, all of the, you know, kinesthetic, auditory, digital. Um, all of the above. Yep. I know the word I'm looking for. It just left me for a second. Modalities. Mm. There we go. <laughs> and that's... Those are elements of perception. Mm. Well, how do we perceive things? Yeah. Through all of those senses. Yep. How do we strengthen what we've just sensed? Make it bigger, brighter, stronger. Yep. And whether that's got anything to do with the thing that happened. Yeah. Or our interpretation of, of it. it. So it's like we, <laughs> we, we talk about the conditioning that women have gone through. As, yep. an, as a just a big fucking wallop example. <laughs> right. And I've asked a few questions here and there in yeah. an attempt to sort of, all right, well, let, let's push back at that a little bit. Is yeah. this what this is or is this what it really is? Yeah. And is there an interpretation that's got more to do with your feeling state about it than the case of affairs in and of itself? Mm-hmm. But, but this is why we do it. Yeah. Because if we don't do that, your perception field is never challenged. H- how do we change? Yeah. How do we, how do we address how we see the world, how we see ourselves? Ever. Yeah. Without the ability to sort of pull back or have some asshole in the other microphone go, <laughs> is that what really happened? Yeah. Did someone actually tell you that or was that what you, yeah. As, as the example. As the example. Well, yeah, exactly. So, you know, our perception filters, by the sounds of it, really get formed either a, you know, through massive traumatic events, which have you know put gridlocks into the nervous system. I'd say that's certainly the most obvious one. Obvious one, um, you know, because that like that in itself clearly changes how you see the see, hear, do things. Mm. Um, like as you just spoken about, like our conditioning, how we're brought up, whether whether direct or indirect. So whether, you know, you're told directly this is what your job is or whether indirectly you are, you know, conditioned or manipulated because that's what normally indirect means. Like, you know, this yeah. is what you're supposed to do. This is what a relationship is supposed to look like. This is what your worth is. You don't know to question it. And being in that, yeah, exactly. Being, you know, growing up, being in that state – being in those households, not knowing any different, that's it. You don't know to question it. Um, and then you come out and all of a sudden that's it. You, that's how you see and perceive the world. Mm. Um, as you said, like if you go looking for red flags, you're going to find them if you're going, you know. And that's just that, an example. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, so that's how you see and perceive things. That's how you filter the information out, especially if your worth, for example, is is low and you're just like, I'm a piece of shit and I'm worth nothing. Well, your gee, I wonder what scenarios you're going to source out. You're pretty much going to filter. It's like almost like the shadow. You know, you are unconsciously going to manifest into your life the parts of you that you've disconnected, disowned, in order to be liked, loved, and accepted. But it, on on the flip side of that, like you know, one thing I say to a lot of my clients as well, like, is you unconsciously teach people how to treat you by how you treat yourself. You don't actually have to say anything out loud. 
um, that's you know harmful to yourself. You can, but your energy, your aura, how you conduct yourself, how you talk, how you, you know, all of those sort of things. And that's why we were saying before about yeah. like this is how many different versions of perception filter there is. Yeah. So how do you hold yourself? Yeah. How do you carry yourself? All those sort of things. Just in and of that singular example, yeah. it's like if you see yourself standing in a mirror holding yourself actually kind of hunched over and it's like how would you perceive that person if it wasn't you? Yeah. You look kind of sad. Or like, low confidence or whatever else. And it's like why wouldn't your subconscious, whether that's – genuinely deep or even in the shadow interpret mm. that as you the same way yeah so and then that's the perpetuation of it yeah so yeah then you're going to filter for all of those sort of things that are going to make you right as you just said confirmation bias again yeah it's like oh you know I'm, I'm worthless so people come in and treat me like trash because i'm worthless and i felt really gross saying that but you know it's i, I get why yeah because it's not a it's not a thing that you're happy just saying. No. Because it sucks. Right. But it's kind of how it works. Mm. That's that safe and right thing. So, and it, we could then argue that, all right, there's many different layers we could sort of look at perception filters. Yeah. One of the more fundamental ones that I would argue exists no matter who you are is the inclination of the human brain to look at things negatively. Yeah. I know you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Where, again, it's that, it's that depth of human evolution, evolution biology and ev evolutionary mm. psychology of like, well, how do I keep myself safe? Mm. Well, you know, those people who just go with worst case scenario yeah. and just run with that. Yeah. If they find out that that's not what's going to happen, then well, that's a nice, pleasant surprise. Yeah. Um, is that it? almost like I think what I was saying earlier is like when you sit there and go, "Oh no, I can't do that," and you say that to yourself, you find all the ways and the hows and the reasons of why you can't do something um, to prove your point. Is it Henry Ford? Yeah. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Either way. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's kind of what it boils down to. It's like. Mm. The fundamental truth of us being, frankly, kind of weak and feeble when it comes to the majority of the animal world means that we kind of need to perceive the universe as a big fucking threat. Yeah. Which is... And then attempt to mitigate that. Yeah, which is super fascinating because, um, like, as, as human beings, like, and our evolution of that... One of the one of the one of our biggest strengths that we have that no one else in the animal kingdom has is our ability to adapt and overcome, which is super fascinating. So, I absolutely agree. Yeah, we look at evolution as an example. Yeah, but because of our ability, because of neuroplasticity. Yeah, because of stem cells. Yeah, which we all just have waiting for cool shit to need doing done. <laughs> yep that'll do yeah like we're literally built for it yeah everything mm, <laughs> almost everything else that can be called alive on the face of this planet has found its niche yeah and until the environmental stress has demanded that it change it has no reason to mm. and the wild thing is that, that happens over i don't know how many millions of years yeah but you sort of microcosm that within us. We're, we're capable of adapting in profound ways yeah. over the course of our lifetime. Our lifetime, exactly. How many of you guys actually do that though? How many adapt and then go, okay, well, this is not working. How do I change it? So when people say we're still animals, what you just said is kind of what I believe that they mean. It's like we still want to find that niche. We still want to find that place of successfully made sense of the world and yeah. just be cool with that. The problem is that we are a bit more sophisticated in terms of how we interpret the world yeah, and the emotional responses we do and don't have to that. 
so um, we have the capacity to heighten the unpleasantness of the world around us or the awesomeness of the world around us. Yeah. So, like, this is why we're different. I've kind of gone off on a... A wee tangent. But ironically enough, those are still perception filters. Mm. I think we are seemingly the only creature that we know of that the government has been upfront about existing. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you just sort of stop like, where the fuck am I going? Uh, that no, but didn't USA? But that's my. That, that, yeah. That's why I mean, uh, uh. let's let's not just just. Yeah, aliens exist. Okay, well, <laughs> only have, have just admitted only it. just admit it. But like, presumably, the ability to develop interstellar travel has probably required a certain amount of cognitive fudge. Right. <laughs> but anyway, we seemingly are certainly the most effective, if not the only creature on this planet capable of projecting ourselves into the future. Yeah, it could be argued that's where anxiety comes from. We see a future that we don't like. Yeah. And weirdly it stresses us out. But then there's stress and the stress. But we tend to see a future that we don't like based on past experiences that we have. Perception filters. So, yeah, there's your perception filter right yeah. there. And we're also taught that or condition, what, you know, we're also... Whatever. F- whatever you want to call it, we're filtered. <laughs> mm. um, to, to do that... And or you know we're filtered or conditioned that the unknown is scary and it's not safe and all of that sort of stuff rather than well actually confusion and unknown is the world's greatest resource because it drives that adaptability that you were describing yep. that neuroplasticity that stem cell that needs stimulus to actually work. work well how else do you create new neural pathways. Is you step into that? Well, that's how we adapt and how we so overcome. You learn any kind of new skill. Right. You practice and suck over and over again until you practice and get good. That's what evolution is. Yeah, it's just that calling the lifetimes worth of evolution evolution just seems to not be <laughs> right enough. No, <laughs> yeah. you know, and and then that sort of leads me to wonder as well, like and think because, like, I think as well. <sighs> you know, whatever you want to call it, someone somewhere got afraid of this evolution or of this, you know, ability to adapt and overcome, which I think a lot of it is what, you know, we're going through like over the last year or something like that. I think I mentioned in the last episode, if not the episode beforehand, where there's this massive change of timeline of, you know, especially women, men too, I've been like, fuck this. I'm out, I can't do this anymore, I'm worth more, whatever the case may be, Mm. leaving unhealthy relationships, leaving toxic relationships and all this sort of stuff because they've been filtered and conditioned that this is what life is, you know, beige. Um, And I wonder if somewhere someone got really afraid of like, oh, if they, you know, become smarter because, I don't know, I have not not another word for it. Are we going to start this conversation again? No, probably not, but maybe. Um... Then sorry that that's that's me in my <laughs> head knowing where this is going, <laughs> dear listeners. Um, and there's going well. We can't have that, so we're going to make sure we don't grow and evolve. Or yeah. So if I said that the advent of monotheism, because you just we're all about the big fancy words today. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> no, you can so have them. Mono, monotheism describes the kind of religion that has one God. Okay. Okay. Not here to um, blame religion specifically. But the point of a monotheistic religion is that mm. there is one God, they are up on high, they know all, see all made you yeah that mm-hmm. if they made you perfect why would we bother adapting and adjusting when we're made in god's image why would we change that how blasphemous and heretical of you burn them 
Yeah. Sound familiar? Sounds very familiar. Now, I put that at the feet of monotheism. Yeah. But there would have been instances before then. Mm. That's the the most organised, biggest picture version I can think of. Mm. Who's to say there wasn't a couple of dodgy tribal chiefs that said, no, 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 I'm boss and I say, this is how shit goes. Yeah. Exiled if you argue. Yep. How many people want to risk that? Yeah, that's it. So you then, you know, you you put your perception and your filters on for that. And and, or, (coughs) or take them off. Yeah. Because if you are an upright, vaguely sentient human, you're going to have questions come up. Yeah. You just are. If you don't like it tough, it, it, like you've got this big <laughs> mushy bit in between your ears that's not your nose. Yeah. That just does that. Well, it's designed to because, well, we're designed to learn. that, But that's that adaptability. Yeah. <coughs> That's that adaptability. That's the neuroplasticity conversation you were having before. It's yeah. like if, if you don't do that, how do you survive new, awkward and uncomfortable things? Yeah. And the problem with the subject that we're talking about, perception filters, is that if we don't challenge them, mm. they become quite limiting in their own way. They're, yeah. they're, they become our own monotheistic God. Yeah. That stunts us. Well, essentially, then it turns into our limiting beliefs or our negative beliefs. That's, that's exactly what they are. You know, and... Tell me those aren't perception filters. Right. Yeah. And the funny thing about beliefs, or especially negative ones, like only negative ones, is that they're not yours. They're somebody else's perception. Ha! Ah, there's that word again. Mm-hmm. Perception of you that you've just, you know... Perception or projection. Like this... E- either or. Yeah. It's the yeah. same thing, you know. Your perception of me is a reflection of you. Yeah. Your projection of me is a reflection of you. But then we have that awkward conversation about that person projecting is only doing that based on the limitations of their own perception filters Of their as own well. filters, yeah. And whether that was what they were taught or how they've successfully, inverted commas, made sense of the world and their own yeah. management of perception of the world in and around them. It it, it's what it is. Yeah. And if you've got someone with enough pointy sticks to say, this is how things ams. Yeah. Like the last episode we were talking about the like like you know what communism or or things like that look like. Even with the best of intentions. So you, you create a perception where the behavior is more important than the ideal that was supposed to drive them. Mm. At which point, like what you said before about those limiting beliefs, they're almost always like a like that negative version. Even the positive versions can, like toxic positivity. Yeah. Your refusal to look at the reality of a situation. Yeah, so, oh, it's all love and light. It'll be fine. God will sort me out or whoever you happen to yeah. want to save you. Yep, that'll do. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> that changes perceptions. As well. As well. It's like yeah. It, it's, it's a certain amount of railroading of. Well, it's almost by the sounds of it. And obviously we've all, we've all got different filters on, you know, but by the sounds of it and what I believe is what's coming up at the moment is that, yeah, you, you have a set of perception filters on for how you see the world and, and you know, like as you said, with like, like toxic positivity or... As y- one example. As one example, you know, we can call like narcissism another example, we can call mm. empaths another example and the list goes on type thing. All of those, you're, you've got one set of filters on essentially, which means you're suppressing a whole bunch of other shit mm. that, you know, could be really great... Mm. Or really shit, but that's just the life experience. You know, when you're more designed, because we're all we always have filters. It's not something we can sort of get rid of and be completely. You have an ego. Yeah, it's a thing. You can't really get rid of it and just yeah. be completely open minded because that would be too overwhelming. It's like the whole memory thing. Um, you know that I was just talking about beforehand. There's a reason that we 
delete memories there's a reason that it goes into all different spaces of the brain because if everything all come back if we remembered every single little fucking thing we wouldn't be able to function I wonder how people with the proverbial photographic memory or eidetic memory. Well, it's actually scientifically proven now that that's not a thing. It's just their ability to recall memory is fantastic. And and they even then mm. the ability to reinterpret. Like, I imagine for that person, yeah, it'd be the proverbial neuro spicy conversation as well. Yeah. So I imagine that there's that person who is now sitting there. And having some real issues creating subjectivity mm. because they remember everything and recall it so well. Like, how could you function? Well, like, overwhelm, burnout comes into mind. Like, you know, as you said, with that whole spicy thing, um, spicy, neuro spicy people. And yes, like, you know, even to have a photographic memory or your ability to recall memory, mm. like, you know, that is far surpassing the normies, that that level has to come with some downsides. And I wonder if it's sorry. Yeah. That's okay. I, uh, I wonder if it's they maybe maybe. Maybe. I was about to say, I wonder if that makes them more susceptible to trauma. Because they remember everything. Yeah, or even more susceptible to overstimulation. I was going to say, or does it protect them from that? Yeah. Because they remember everything. everything. So there's less subjective interpretation of mm. it. That, And even then, like, it's a pretty black and white conversation. It is like About a human that's just... A hodgepodge of amazingness, wild shit, you know. But <laughs> so, you know, before I went on my wee tangent, coming back, so we, we then those people that have like you know, creating identities, I guess, so to speak, mm. you know, you then have one set of filters on and that's it, mm -hmm. you know. But when you have that one set of filters on and that's it, all you're doing then is suppressing a whole bunch of other stuff, whether internally or externally, because obviously, as I said, like your brain looks for evidence. If you mm. say you can't do something, your brain's going to look for all the fucking ways that you can't because that's what you're filtering for. Yeah. Um, you know, like changing, changing, because as I said, removing those filters just doesn't happen. The ability to adapt and change those filters to whatever scenario, situation, event is necessary I wonder if that's like a really cool conversation. Well, I believe it is anyways. Like when you start to then look at, at yourself and do the inner work, clear the, you know, clear the living beliefs that are holding you back, integrate the shadow, you know, know that you are all things and all things are you. Because, you know, I just sounded like Buddha then. I was just like, <laughs> no, <laughs> fucking Zen. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. My head went to a place of, what if in a very real point of view, the analogy is the alchemistic reinterpretation of things is that the filters are the glass by which you have the world distorted to suit that glass pane. Yeah. And what you realistically end up in is, <laughs> this is what I was laughing to myself about, a glass case of emotion <laughs> <laughs> where it is the box by which you see everything outside of you and by which everything that comes through those glass panes yeah. are then refracted and reinterpreted. Yeah. So it's like it's its own prison in so much as it's a way by which to crystallize and formulate yourself. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense because then even like my brain just went to like looking at energetics, for example. Um, so I, like I think the better part of this year I've been diving into like human design mm -hmm. Um, after my ADHD, ADHD diagnosis, I was just like, you know, diving into energetics and stuff. And it was really interesting that how my design and how I'm like literally blueprinted to operate is literally how, what my ADHD is, you know. So mm. there's a thing. But I was having a chat to one of my mentors um, last week 
because one of my friends um, had been struggling with his daughter going through bullying and stuff like that. And I was like, I was, you know, trying to give some advice on, you know, good doctors to see for help and, you know, mindset work and all this sort of stuff. And I was like, I'm wondering what her energetics is, you know, given the situations that were happening. And um, I, like I did, a, did it all up and I, you know, gave him all the information that was the best to my knowledge. And I said, there's a couple of things I'm really curious about. I'm just going to ask my mentor and come back. And I came back and it was really interesting. Um, so her profile lines, like I know from my profile lines, um, I'm a th- like I'm pretty sure the two fours, the three fives, and there was another one um, that I can't remember. Everyone, these numbers make absolute Ooh. perfect sense to Sky. But no one It's else. okay if you don't. Yeah. But so there was out of the, um, you know, I think it's like five different profile sets. I think two or three of those um, view the world internally mm-hmm. and then the other ones view the world externally. So literally how they operate is internally. Everything is almost taken personally. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's how they view the world. Like mm-hmm. there was yep. a point, see, I'm getting to the filter part, right? Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, the other profiles view things externally. So they view things externally and then bring them in, yep. you know, and her her profile line was viewing things internally. So she was viewing things like as a, you know, herself personally. This is something personal against her type thing and and how she viewed her life is literally as a, as a personal thing rather than things happening externally and she's just witnessing it yeah so because i just went no 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 far out to the left so, there. so this is this is yet another version of mm. so like you could look at personality sciences entirely in that way so for example what you've just described with your human design conversation we could then overlay something like um the myers-briggs yeah system where eight of them are introverted eight of them are extroverted um i think the engram stuff seems to work in a similar sort of sense i'd also argue that i've seen some interpretations of how star signs work in a similar sort of way it's like these people seem to take things a certain way very more emotional and or or, or however you want to frame it but like you know like we're not going to get into (laughs) (laughs) the next step of this conversation just yet whatever filter you're using it it inevitably (coughs) inevitably because that's the word dish yeah still comes back to like how does it serve you yeah so the analogy that we're using before now whether that's human design that that sure as shit works for you yeah because it helps you make sense of yourself and the world around you and how you want to play your part in that yes it serves the fuck out of you yeah winning (laughs) i lean into the the myers-briggs stuff yeah because that helps you it it helps me not because it's the be all and end all but because it just gives you an opportunity to have a bit of a template and it could be argued that's what these filters are they're a bit of a template to try and understand the world around you or like you call it you're like almost like a scaffolding that'll do yeah like something that allows you to make sense make sense of you and of things around you. everything else around you but that whole you know like you know again with the identity thing and, and you know that would relay into the perception thing as well is there will become a point where that scaffolding and that view of you and the world becomes limited. limited. So, glad you brought it back to there. Because the analogy of that glass case of emotion, mm. milk was a bad choice. <laughs> it was a good one. Sorry? I was like, it was a good one. In my head I'm going, oh, be, you know, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Sorry, I was <laughs> thinking of the Anchorman reference. But yeah, anyway. I had an analogy a little while ago. I actually wrote a blog about it. It was this idea that most people and their ego could be interpreted as putting together a jigsaw puzzle. At the start, you need the corner pieces. You build out the edges. You fill the gaps in the middle in. 
And we could use that as an analogy for how we grow and evolve as a human. Mm. But I would argue we want to take it one step further beyond that. So you, you do the initial framing of yourself. So let's say a corner piece is family. Another corner piece is work. Yeah. Another corner piece is peer group. Another corner piece is, I don't know, gender. Because it, cause it matters. Yeah. Because it's a factor that interprets how the world works with you and for you and all that yeah. sort of stuff. And then you build out the bridging pieces that allow you to sort of have said yeah. scaffolding. Family is this. That. This is that. This is that. This and is that. And then all the middle pieces end up becoming the little core memories that have all the interactive borders of your sense yeah. itself. Well, it's essentially how you, your perception value, uh, perception filters then link into your values. Mm. You know, and whether you know whether good or bad. Now, that's not saying your values are bad. It's got nothing to do with that. But you it's know, what they, yeah. yeah. Um, but the energy on those and and the filters that you have on can be the limiting factor. That, but that's where we're getting to. Well, at least what I think I'm getting to. Oh, sorry, I kind of you, like you, jumped you're ahead. Good. No, no, no. <laughs> it's it's the bridging step. Yeah. So we use that jigsaw analogy or that glass case of emotions analogy. It's, it, it's the way in which you perceive the world. But eventually we want to get you to the point where as important as those border pieces certainly were, yeah. are they now a limitation? Yeah. Do you become so centered within yourself that you can st- sit there and say these perceptions, these filters, these corner pieces no longer serve me mm. in that way anymore. I don't need to border myself up. I don't need to keep myself in any yep. more than I need to keep things out. Yep. So we go back to the boundary episode. Yeah. Episodes. Yep. And you become. Well, then we also go back to, you know, anger is a vile part of a healing episode. We go back to the shadow mm. episode. Like, How do you break down those borders to sort of build out more of yourself beyond those borders yeah. without the ability to smash a panel of that glass case of emotion or yeah. break all the edges off of the jigsaw mm. puzzle to add more pieces that are no longer like edge pieces or corner pieces anymore. Or even just I know I'm getting this. Yeah. The, the analogy is getting clunky, but. Yeah. Yeah, or just remove pieces so you can add different ones in. That's what I mean. Yeah. So, like, uh, what's that movie? Um, is it Inside Out? Is that the Emotions movie? Yeah. Yes. Like, that is, like, once the main emotion, the happy character, realises that she's not built to be happy all the, the time. time. The same with your, you're not built to have just these five core emotions or mm. sorry five core emotions five core memories that that and that's just it yeah so that, that's not it's not what you're here for and that goes back to that adaptability conversation again yeah so you're built to become more mm. hopefully <laughs> but that's well, investment and you attention. are that's the thing we're all built to become more it's just whether or not you're willing enough to step into that space of unknown or yeah. admit that your, you know, perception filters, for example, mm. are no longer serving you. In a limitation of yourself or a refusal to let other things that could grow you in. In, yeah. And that's what I said, like, you, you kind of want to end up, you know what, I'm not going to tell that story right now. <laughs> But you end up being this, I don't know. Beige. You're way beige. cooler than beige. Way cooler than beige. Almost like, like. This cool big cloud of smoke <laughs> that is in and of itself quite well formed. It has tangibility in its way. Yeah. But. It's still malleable. It's still adaptable. Water. Slime. Th- that'll do. <laughs> a, a good example. It's like water fills the gap provided, yeah. but it becomes so much more yeah. once that shape changes. Mm. Or like that's what you're for. And we could talk about archetypal sort of behaviors and all this sort of stuff and how you're all of them and none of them at the same time. time. Yeah. The point is that you invest in this version of yourself for what this requires and that version of yourself that requires. Yeah. But not being come so comfortable 
and institutionalized by the borders that keep you is this version of yourself yeah. and recognize that you are way more than that mm. and acting accordingly. Exactly. And without questioning how you perceive the world around you, let alone yourself within it, mm. it like you just don't. Yep. You don't become more. No, well, that's it. And almost taking it back to the neuroplasticity and, you know, the neuro grooves and all of that sort of stuff, which essentially is still your filters that you've put on. Yeah. It's how... Well, it's how I know for me personally. So I'm going to say me personally before I like, you know, project outwards that I've gone through a whole bunch of shit and I I thrive in my life. You know. What the fuck is the point of being alive if you're not at least aiming for that, if not yeah. living it? It's so it's basically saying, you know, and if you want to look at the sciencey version of it if you want, you know, which is, you know, neuroplasticity and brain growth and neuro grooves and, and making new grooves is it's how people overcome trauma and, and be able to thrive is because they they change their neuro pathways. They make new grooves and they work hard to cement those grooves, which essentially is changing your perception filters. Mm. You know, you still have that knowledge but in the back of your mind. Like that never goes away. Mm. So like as you said, like with the person that goes, oh, well, this is, you know, nothing's going to happen because they, they know everything or they've been through everything and they can recall that memory. Right. That is still there. So you are still in a space of like, growth and, and you know empowerment i guess so to speak to go uh i know that behavior i remember that behavior i'm gonna go that way now yeah but but that's you were always the all right what i was saying before about the archetypes and all that sort of stuff mm. that's kind of what i'm it, yeah, almost yeah. exactly what i meant that's it's like it. you were always that version of you as part of the greater you mm. you just you didn't know. Yeah. And that's the point of like, you know, the analogy of saying is it almost becomes a prison at that point. So mm. well, you're imprisoning your ability to see yourself as something different. different. Yeah. Because you don't know any other way to be. Yeah. Which is fine, but. Is that way serving you or not? That. Like, we, we've had a couple of conversations recently mm. off air when it comes to a friend of ours. And the ability to have her version of communication heard. Yeah. But also have his version of communication heard as well. Mm. And the necessity of adjusting your filters as though the priorities that you have, yeah. the expectations that you have, the things that you value. Yeah. It's just going to be different from the person next to you and being able to step back just slightly mm. to be able to reinterpret what they might be thinking and like how important that is for any kind of communication or empathy. Yeah, I was going to say, for the people playing at home, that is called practicing empathy. Yeah, because <laughs> like, if you don't do that... No, you will only see the world through your view or your perception of that. Yeah. You know, just as much as like if you... I think we've like, you know, we've also had this same conversation and where it's like communicating with someone, for example, a lot of, a lot of the time, not all of the time, we're like, you know, taking out like full-blown abuse and toxicity and stuff like that. Conversation generally. Nine times out of ten, you know, someone can take something really personally but the other person actually did not mean anything personal by it. You know, and, and so, as you said, with that whole, like, taking that step back and practicing empathy is, like, being able to then communicate going, well, what did you mean by that? Or, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So that other person can then sort of take a step back and go, okay. I, can I, I could see how they would take it that I way. I could see how could they could take it that way, yeah. but that's totally not what I meant. Awesome. Because, you know, they're speaking through their model of the world and the other person is receiving information through their model of the world and... Those two things are never the fucking same. And that's ultimately what we're talking about. It's mm. like how things leave your filters and come back in and through your filters. That, that's a you thing. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it is a you thing. 
that's not to say that they shouldn't be taking care about how they address and deal with you. So they're not just calling you a C bomb or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. And thinking, oh no, they didn't have to interpret that word that way. That's on them. Yeah. It's like, no, you're a, you're the asshole. Yeah. In that conversation. <laughs> Sorry, love. That's using spirituality to be an asshole. Or, or, I was, about, I was literally about to say the C word. Then. <laughs> It's sad. It's not like we haven't put a label warning on the on the potty. No, yeah, it's all the way very explicit. Yeah. But like ultimately, that's what it comes down to. So mm. you, you sort of mentioned empathy. So I'd argue gratitude is the exact same thing. It's like yes. how do you realign your filters to see value in what's currently going on for you, as yeah. opposed to this is fucking miserable. Yeah. Cool. This is just my life. Yeah. Well, I guess I deserve that because I'm a piece of shit. You know, all of that cascading. Yeah shit yeah that it's like this is just how you think life works and mm. now you've got a neural groove that just says that this is what how life works and unfortunately the the strength of that groove is that safe and right mechanic that keeps you stuck well the strength in that groove is is how many times you replay that groove mm. you know and you know because the more you replay it the strength it becomes like you know neurons that fire together wire together yeah Literally. Yeah, literally. That's how they connect. So I recently heard something that was suggesting that on a cellular level, not yeah. just a neuronal level, a cellular level, we can develop cellular antenna. Yeah. That act effectively like neurons where on a cellular and this is, you know, the, the trauma happens in the body and the story yeah. in the body. Th this is kind of how it works. Yeah, exactly. That the signal of this, this vibrational signal, this electrical signal, this energetic signal, whatever, whatever. is received on that cellular level mm. by these antennae that then act and are programmed accordingly. Yep. Well, I was going to bring up self-talk just before. Yeah. As that. You, you, the, the neurons that wire together, like yeah. everything you was just saying to lead into that. It's like, this is why self-talk is a huge fucking deal. Fuck yes. Because it's one thing to hear it from outside of you. Mm. It's another thing to hear it constantly within you. Yep. So like the glass case of emotion sort of thing. It's like, if your filters do not let out that self-talk, it just refracts and refracts and refracts and mm. becomes like this, uh, who, <laughs> you know what happens when you use a magnifying glass on ants, right? That whole like we're gonna set them on fire, like little little psychopaths. Yeah, maybe that's what we're talking about as well. You have yeah. all this information that just filters in and becomes this burning, stinging point that's yeah. cooking you from the inside out, which is as unpleasant as an analogy I can think of to describe self talk. Yeah, negative self talk. Well, the cool thing is, and the fun thing is, like I, I didn't realize this. And then when I realized it, I was just like. How did I not realize this? But when we are out of our head and in our body, when we're in our body, we're in the present moment, guys. So mm -hmm. for all of you guys that, you know, go, oh, I struggle to be in the present moment or anything like that, the simplest way to get yourself into the present moment, one is to breathe, but it's essentially taking the process of like, you know, up here and into your body. So when you are in the present moment, there is no self-talk. Because there's nothing to for it to grip onto. There's no past or there's no future. Because essentially self-talk is like, you know, that whole mm. um, anxiety about the future thing because based on past events. Neither one of those you're in the present moment. You're constantly evaluating the future based on the past and you're not here today. So, yes, absolutely awesome. Yeah. I was like, that's cool. The point. Of, uh, this is my interpretive point mm. of things like Buddhism, for example, yeah. of Taoism, for example, of um, Jungian psychoanalytics, for example. Yeah. This is going to be a whole other possibly big series of discussions we have as we go. But mm. the point is that Buddhism is an attempt to dissolve the self. Mm-hmm. Taoism is an attempt to dissolve the mind. Mm -hmm. Jungian psychoanalytics is an attempt to dissolve the ego. Mm -hmm. Now, in my interpretation, those three things are the exact same. Yeah, I was going to say, aren't they the same thing? Yes, but it's just how you frame it. <laughs> yeah. Because 
if this is a theory, but if that interpretation that we've just made is true, yeah, that sounds suspiciously like the conscious mind. Yep. And that as the monkey thought process by which we're describing that lack of presence yeah. means that those three practices, Buddhism, Taoism, psycho, psychoanalytics, is an attempt to become less conscious and more present. Yes. Which is kind of funny because like we, we describe present as conscious and, and not being present well, as well, unconscious. <laughs> maybe a better word would be but you're aware. Right. Yeah, but you're right. Like your conscious brain – is is essentially how – that's where your ego is. It's where that's, your critical factor that's is. why I yeah. think you do most of your, your thinking with your ego. Yes. And if your ego is basically, it, to make the analogy, the layers by which your filters stack up mm. to colour or change the information going mm. in, it's like, well, if you spend all your time there, no wonder you can't be present. You're too busy trying to interpret the world. And Hello, if, everyone. if all of those filters are telling you you're not safe, for example, mm. why on earth would you want to be present with the world around you? You just don't feel like you've got the capacity, space, time, uh, want. Yeah. So the attempt to dissolve that ego, that layers of filters, that mm. self, that mind. Whatever, yeah. That's why it's necessary to become conscious of those things. Like what thoughts are actually going through your mind? Yeah. And then you med- do the metacognition process where you p- sort of pull back and look at those filters and go, mm. I, uh, <laughs> I'm not happy with that anymore. Yeah. Can I dissolve that one? Yep. What do I need to do to do that? Do I need to go and talk to Sky and have my head shrunk? <laughs> Which is where the phrase comes from. It's like yeah. you have that mind shrunk. So there's less filters by which to fuck your own thoughts up. Yeah. That's an oversimplification. Sounds well, a bit harsh, but you know what I mean. Well, it's essentially right. It's just like you have less to fuck yourself up with, mm. you know, or you go through and remove the beliefs or, you know, whatever blockages are in your nervous system yeah. and, and your mind because essentially the blockages are in both because it's in the body. Yeah. It's not just in the mind. Um, Where do you feel your emotions? In the body. It, it's not weird, surely. Everything that you feel is actually in your body. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with your head at all. Um, we just make make sense of it in our head, or we like. It's the computation mm. by which you interpret yourself and the world around you. This is exactly what we started talking about with filters. Yeah, it's like well, you are not your thoughts. Well, it's isn't that I guess the same thing? It's like you are not your, you know. The person, the person, the behavior is the behavior. Yeah. Behavior is not the person, and the person is not the behavior. Yeah. In the same way that you are not your thoughts and you're not your body. Yeah. You're the. Uh, <laughs> We're going like woo woo now. You're the spirit ghost piloting the meat popsicle <laughs> that experiences the sensation that could be interpreted as feeling. Yeah. That is engaging in the interpretive process that is thought. Mm. And. Balancing that with all that stored memory in the rest of your meat puppet, in the soggy bit between your ears, it's not your nose. <laughs> that balances all that out. That. Is that enough of a tangent to sort of be able to pull back from to say, yeah, if you feel if your filters are a bit crap, then how you see the world's going to be a bit, a bit crap. crap. Yeah. Have we made our point about why the filters by which you perceive yourself in the world are important? Yeah, I think so. Do we do we like drop some exciting stuff? Which bit? Oh yeah, there's lots, right? Well, there's a couple of things. I'm, I'm trying to do hand signals and Todd's like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Sorry, I saw there's three. Yeah. How about we just say, screw it. Screw it. Right. Yep, say it. Which is the first one? Uh, we're doing a little bit more of a collaborative uh, treatment. 
portal. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Total self discovery and healing portal. Mm-hmm. Which is super. That exciting. was one of the ones you meant, wasn't it? It was one of the ones I meant. Okay. Wasn't the one that I was like actually going to like drop right now, but that's cool. Let's drop this. So okay. when you listen to this and you'll, you know, be like, oh, fuck, I want to know more, or, you know, just mm. because you like hearing us talk or on how the we do things or how we unpack things. Dulcet and soothing tones that is Sky's voice. <laughs> Not. There is a super amazing membership. Now whose negative self-talk <laughs> filters are kicking in. <laughs> that. There is a super amazing membership subscription portal open for you guys that both Todd and I are in to help you guys on your journey, wherever you are, working at your own pace. All the details are going to be linked in the show notes. So you can totally jump in. It's not built, built. Oh, it's a growing ecosystem. That. It's like. So, yeah. So it's a growing ecosystem. There's heaps of amazing stuff in there at the moment. Um, and it's just something that's going to continue to grow as my amazing creative brain creates more. It just goes in there. Same with Todd. Every time he creates something new, it goes in there. I think mostly I just talk about this stuff I'm thinking about yeah. in here. Maybe, maybe I need to, yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> there's just heaps of goodness in there. Mm. So there's that, which is cool. And the second thing is if you want to wear your soul spirit dancing in a meat flesh popsicle on a way cool T-shirt. Yeah, we're doing that too. There is some awesome, awesome merchandise coming out not not quite so crass as to just put our names on everything and say we're awesome just ask us <laughs> but you know there, there's some cool stuff that we're neuro spicy in our way through <laughs> <laughs> some of it will specifically reference said neuro spicy <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> mm-hmm and other things will reference your cycle breaker. Yeah. We're going to have heaps, heaps of cool stuff. Mm. Heaps of cool stuff. Again, linked in the show notes. If it's not, feel free to... Send me an abusive text message. I was going to say... Or, or Leave Sky like, alone. <laughs> slide into my DMs and go, where the fuck is this? Because, yeah. Sorry, I've never not heard slide into my DMs as a non... Creepy, creepy thing. <laughs> so I just, just had to sit with it for a sec. Uh, mm. What was the third one? No. <laughs> Is this true for now? Yeah. Cool. I, I haven't... I just lost one. Yeah. Brain went meh. Feel like you're as we like go really quiet now. Okay. We're trying to hand sign things. Okay. We get it? Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell there was like no planning to that at all? None. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of put you on the spot. <laughs> I didn't even say, I'm like, should we mention this before we were pretty Yeah, it's like, like I'm that. sitting here like relatively blindsided and going, <laughs> I'm just trying to roll with it. And he's like, this guy had a plan. No, no, I'm, that's almost giving you too much credit. I had half a plan. Yeah, you're like, is this a thing? Yeah, fuck it, roll with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just going, yeah, go us. <clears throat> More details to come. Yeah. And with that being said, be good. Be kind. Be your best self. That's all right. You can say it. I'll let you. No I, bar fights. I blindsided you. <laughs> it's fine. Like <clears throat> We're going to add a fifth one in. Just specifically to let you say the one you really, really want to <laughs> say. Come on. There is so much dopamine in no bar fights. That's. Look, I'm trying to be a team player here. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Until next be week. Be good. Be smart. Be kind. kind. Be your best, you know bar fights. Yeah, there's the five. All right, yep. so we'll figure it out. We just clearly we need to do some rehearsal. <laughs> Can you tell this is ad lib? <laughs>
<laughs> There's no way they can tell that. No, not mm. at all. Anyway. Anyways. See you guys. See you next week.